All right, everybody. Um, <clears throat> today we're just gonna focus on testing. Why? No big surprise. Um, <clears throat> the end of this course, not only are you supposed to pass the course in itself and do all the work and learn American history along the way, but what do you have to pass at the end of the year? The EOC, the end of course exam. That's 30% of your grade. <clears throat> So a huge chunk of my job with you is I have to teach you, I have to prepare you to pass this exam. It's a very real possibility. If you don't do particularly well in the class and you fail that exam, you might have to repeat the year. Nobody wants that. So I gotta do my job in not just teaching you history, but teaching you how to pass, well, teach you what you need to know to pass this test. But there's another layer to it. What if I told you that I could teach you how to take this test intelligently, or any multiple choice exam that you could take. Because the EOC is not the only one you've ever taken or will take in the future. Your life is gonna be full of multiple choice exams. There's, I don't wanna say a dumb way to go about it, just blindly diving into the exams. There's actually a smart way to go about it. <clears throat> and that smart way is gonna increase your chances of passing. Well, we've had data chats in the past, and the administrators asked me, why am I passing your rate so high? I said, that's because I pay attention, not just to teaching history, but I spent some time with my students about test-taking strategies. There are strategies that you could use to increase your chances at passing a multiple choice exam. And so we're gonna look at some of these strategies today, which I hope that you use in the future, not just in my exams, and of course, at the end of course exam, then all of your multiple choice exams, guaranteed. If you start approaching your multiple choice exams intelligently, understanding that sometimes these exams can be game, you'll increase your chances of success. So let's look at something. I'm not the one that invented this. I picked this up at a workshop years ago. It's called the three pass strategy. Multiple choice questions are uniquely American. They're not perfect questions. Um, they're meant more for how do I grade a large number of exams in a short period of time. They're more about efficiency and expediency than you know assessing whether the kid really understands the material or not. But it is what it is, and these are the questions that we have, and they're all around us. They're probably the most common type of question you'll find. Sometimes you find them with four options, sometimes you find them with five options. So you've got a multiple choice exam in front of you, if it's paper or it's computer. Let's talk about the right way to approach this. And one system or strategy you might <coughs> want to think about is called the three-pass strategy. And this is the way the three-pass strategy works. So you get the test in front of you. The first thing I want you to do well, first of all, let's talk about for any of this to work, for any of these strategies, whether it's this or another one, for any of them to work, three things had to have happened before you. That you prepared for the exam. You did some reading, you did some study. If you come into a test blind, your chances of success are very low. So whether you actively listened in class, actively pay attention when you were doing the work, read the chapter, prepared, there needs to be some kind of preparation to have happened beforehand. Number two, you gotta make the commitment that you're gonna read every question carefully, word for word. Sometimes exams are timed and it's hard for some people, but you gotta do your best. You're gonna read every question word for word. That's important. And the third thing, you're going to read every option word for word. So these three things have to happen first before we talk about any strategy. You're prepared. You're going to read every question. You're going to read every option. Yes? Um, I have extended time, so does that help? Of course. It gives you more time. Yeah, anything? Just about every exam they give you. You have extended time. Of course that helps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's why they give it to you. So let's talk about the strategy, the three pass strategy. So number one, the first pass. What are we gonna do? We're gonna look at our exam. That's all we're gonna do. We're just gonna look at the exam. 
you're not going to answer anything. It's like whenever you go to the doctor's or the dentist's office, they got magazines lying around. You go through the magazine. You're just flipping through the pages. That's all you're doing. Believe it or not, you are accomplishing something. Maybe not consciously, but at a subconscious level, your brain is picking up on things. Remember, I don't want you to answer anything. I want you to go from question one to the last question. Along the way, you're going to pick up how many diagrams, how many illustrations, how many maps. You're also going to pick up on words that you may already be familiar with that jump out at you. So at a very surface level, believe it or not, you are getting a casual idea of the landscape what the test has to throw at you without answering anything. First pass should not take too, should not take long. You're just going boop, boop, boop. Just a casual glance at every question. Don't answer anything but from the first question to the last question. You may think that nothing is going on, but in here something is going on. Things are registering. Now the second pass. Now, okay, I'm going to start answering questions. Starting with number one. It is what I want you to do. Provided that you read the question carefully and you read the options carefully. Because remember, these things have to happen. If the question is easy to you, if you consider it easy, if you consider the answer pretty obvious, go ahead and answer. And every time you run into a question like that, go ahead and answer. No big deal. But if you run into a question, it's a bit of a challenge. You're not quite sure. On the second pass, what do you think I want you to do? I want you to skip it. Skip that question, trust me. There's no pressure, you can come to it later. Skip that question. So on the second pass, I just want you to take care of the easy ones. And go all the way to the end. Something is happening on that second pass as well. Because as you take more time with the questions and read them more carefully, even to a greater extent, you are picking up on terms that you're familiar with. Historical context you've learned in class that's with you. You're picking up on that. Because that's going to come into play into the third pass. And why the first and the second were so important. Have you ever found yourself taking a test? And somewhere in the wording of a question, maybe later on in the test, you find either clues or the actual answer to a question that was earlier in the test. That happens a lot. But if you just jump in one to the last question, it's kind of hard to go back and fix that. If you use this three-pass strategy, it becomes easier. That's why we're doing these first two passes, because it is very, very common that as we read an exam, we sometimes pick up on clues or the actual answer written into the wording of an actual question that can help us come back and answer a question we might have skipped and get the right answer. The final pass is the third pass, and the final pass is the most difficult one. Because now what do we have left? Everything we skipped. And why did we skip it? Because it was a little hard, right? Now is the time that, okay, <clears throat> we're going to jump into these challenging questions. And we're going to use our brains, okay? We're going to use our brains to answer these questions intelligently. First of all, never skip a question. Let's say the question has four options. And I choose not to answer it. What are the chances that I will ever get that question right? Never. Never. It's zero percent chance that I will ever get that question right. There's guessing and then there is smart guessing. So let's play that game. Let's say I have a question. I don't know what the answer is. I have four options. If I just blindly guess and I bubble one of those four. What are the chances I get it right? 25%. You know what that's better? That's better than zero, isn't it? It's not great, but 25% is a lot better than zero. What we're talking about now is gaming the exam. Now we're playing with odds and probabilities. 
<clears throat> Let's do better than 25%. So since we're on the third pass, let's talk about some steps you could take to improve your chances at getting those difficult questions correct. Has anybody here heard of a process, something called process of elimination? Good. Let's do it. Let's do better than 25%. So you look at those options. Okay, I'm. what's right isn't coming to me right now, but could I single out any options that I know to be dead wrong? Can I, can I find one that is dead wrong? Okay, let's say I find it, cross it out. How many options am I left with? Three. Now, if I blind guess on three options, what's my chances of getting it right? Huh? 33%. It's a little bit better than 25, isn't it? Okay. Now, what if, what if I could find another one that I also know is not the right answer? I'm here, right? If I could knock two of those out of the way, not because I know they're right, but because I know they're wrong, I'm left with two options left. My odds have improved significantly. I'm in coin flip territory, it's 50-50. That means whatever guess I make from that point forward, I have the 50% chance of getting it right or 50% chance of getting it wrong. Sometimes I get lucky. And just by working my way through process of elimination, I can find a third one that I know to be absolutely wrong and like magic, guess what I zeroed in on? The right answer. It doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes it does. Very common scenario, we do process of elimination, and we're usually left with two really good ones. Again, I'll remind you, this only works if you're prepared, if you're doing, reading the questions, and you're reading the options. 50-50 dilemma, those are the hardest ones. We could guess our way out of it, or we could try an even smarter approach. Look at the wording of the question. <coughs> is the question worded in a way that it's asking for a general answer or is it asking for a specific answer? Then look at the options you have left. A question worded for a specific answer, the specifically worded option is probably the right one. A question worded for a rather general answer, the generally worded option is the right one. But let's try something else. As a final step, so we're in a 50-50 dilemma, and we want to do better than just guessing. There's another little method that's called CER, and a lot of language arts teachers use this in their essays. They call it P, Point, Evidence, and Explain. You ever heard of that before? Well, you could apply this to language arts, to essays. Let's apply it to difficult questions. CER. So, Three questions to ask yourself when you're looking at that difficult question you're stuck between two options. Pick one. Pick one of the two. Okay, I claim to say that A is the right answer. Okay, now let's put A to the test. What evidence exists both in the question and in the option that leads you to believe that A is the right answer? And then why do you think that evidence supports the claim? Where's the evidence in that question? Where's the evidence in the wording? And how does that evidence, and it may be a term that stands out to you, how does that evidence prove that in this case, A is the right answer? Then ask these three questions with the other option that's left over. You just may find, by paying particular attention at the evidence, where is the evidence and how does the evidence prove, that's the reasoning part, that that particular option is the right one, might lead you to making a choice that's a little bit better than guessing. Right? And so what are we getting at? If we approach multiple choice exams carefully, do the three pass strategy, and when we approach difficult questions, and we use process of elimination. 
which may lead us to a 50-50 dilemma. And when we're a 50-50 dilemma, we ask those questions about the two options left, we have a much higher chance, here we're talking about chances, of getting that question right and never ever leave it blank. So before we finish though, <clears throat> let's talk about a couple of things that I need you to keep your eyes open. Do trick questions exist? Absolutely. Thank you. Keep your eyes open for these particular things to increase your chances of succeeding in any one of these exams. Number one, distractors. You know what distractors are? And it really has to do with your careful reading. Is there a word somewhere in the question or somewhere in the <coughs> option It sounds right, but that one word would actually make it wrong? And it wasn't put there for that reason, to throw you off. For that, you have to read carefully. That happens a lot. The wording of an option looks really good, but there's a word there, one word there, that makes it all wrong. So be careful with that. Arcane terms, you know what I mean by that? Sometimes the difference between getting a question right and getting a question wrong boils down to one word, and you just may not know the definition. For that, the only solution I have is you have to read more and um, expose yourself to new words all the time. That's a language arts dilemma. As you expand your vocabulary, you will not be hurt by when these, when these things happen. That you run into a word and not knowing what that word means costs you that question. Lastly, there's a special type of question you should always have an eye out for. Questions that are not or accept questions. You've seen them before. The word not or the word accept is in the question. It's usually all caps. Here's why people get these questions wrong. Because as you're taking a multiple choice test, you're looking for the right answer, right? And the right answer is always an answer that's factually true. That whatever's in that right answer, you picked it because it's true. It's something that either really happened or what happened. <coughs> These questions are curveball. But it's not asking you, hey, which one of these options is true? It's actually asking you what? The opposite, right? Which one of these four options is not true? And if you don't keep that in mind, it's very easy to miss the fact that you're being thrown a curveball. Go for an option that's true. Guess what? In those type of questions, three of the options are true. And bubble one of those in and forget the fact that that's not what that question is asking. That question is asking for something that's not true. So this is pretty simple. Pretty clean cut, straightforward. Mm -hmm. I'll remind you one more time. Three passes. The first pass, you're just looking. Second pass, you're answering the easy ones. Third pass, you're answering everything that was left over. And you will answer everything. You don't guess on everything. When you run into hard questions, these are the steps that you should take. Use process of elimination. Try to get as many of those out of the picture as possible. The more you get out of the question, you narrow down your chances of getting it better, getting the right answer. When you're stuck between two, use CER. Claim one, where's the evidence? How does that evidence prove that this is the right answer? Look at the other option. Where's the evidence there? How does that evidence prove that that's the right answer? And always be on the lookout for these guys. All right, so that's our little talk, the little sharing strategies with you. Now, we're gonna give it a try. I want everybody to open up Schoology and go to your class page. We're gonna play around with a couple of questions together in class.
So we're gonna we're gonna take this test together, and we're gonna approach it the same way as well the advice that I just gave. It's five questions. It's not even five. I think it's five. All right. So let's start. Right. None of this um, should be new to you. Do we do it or I can do it? No, we're doing it together in class. This one we're doing it together in class. So actually, you didn't even have to open up anything. I'm just showing it to you. <clears throat> oh, that's not the one I wanted to show you. Never mind. <coughs> that's the one. We'll go to the other one. So everything that I just told you about, just put it into action. How I, how I would do it. There's five questions. So let me maximize the font. What do I do? First pass, what am I doing? Am I answering anything? I'm just looking. Any words jump out at me there? I see John Brown, I see Misery Compromise. I see a couple of terms that jump out at me. Okay, fantastic. Look at this question. Any words that jump out at me? I see secession, I see southern states, Lincoln, that should jump out at everybody, Emancipation Proclamation. Okay, I'm done. <coughs> Third question, anything jumps out? Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation, that jumps out, yeah, you, jumps out at me. Uh, and, and the option, I see the word slaves, I see slaves a couple of times, I see confederate, shouldn't spend too much time. I'm looking at the fourth option, I see civil war, I see the word slavery, I see southerners, northerners, I see Dred Scott, I see Great Britain, okay, these are the words that jump out at me. And then I see a cartoon. Um, casual look at that cartoon, anything jumps out at me? The word slave, right? The word slave jumps out at me. All right, fantastic. So I did the first pass just like Mr. Hernandez asked me to do, right? Let's get out of here. Let's go back. Now, second pass, let's actually answer this guy. Okay, well, I'll leave it up to you guys, you tell me. It seemed like an easy question or, or a difficult question. Anybody think they have the answer? <coughs> Compromise of 1850 in Dred Scott. Um, why, why was it easy to you? Uh, Dred Scott. And what about Dred Scott? What do you know about Dred Scott? I don't remember talking about it in class, so that's fair, if, you know. Well, I thought you did. No, I didn't actually. I might have. But... This is a, a lot of this stuff is supposed to be middle school history. But we're going to count this one as an easy one because you knew it, so why not? All right, take a look at this one. Does anybody think they have the, an the answer to it? If so, then I guess it's one of these <coughs> easy ones. It's not something you want to overthink. C. Yeah, I think, I think that's another one of the easy ones. That's what I, I planned it to be one of the easy ones. The election of Abraham Lincoln as president. Okay. Let's see if we're going to run into any hard ones. What's significant about the Emancipation Proclamation. Is this one easy to anybody? Yeah. What, what would you say? I think it's the first one. That wouldn't be correct. So you know what? We're going to say that was a little bit harder. We're going to skip it. How about this one? Is this strike? Is any, anybody has an easy question? Yes, sir. Hey, so the following contributed to the outbreak of the Civil War. Southerners feared Northerners intended to abolish it. Is this easy to you? Pretty much. Okay. So we'll say it's one of the easy ones. Sure. How about this one? Here we got a cartoon, a lot of talking in the cartoon. There's also some captions. Let me give you the options. With social issues addressed in this cartoon, the safety of workers, the need for public education, the conditions of the Southern slaves, or the polluted air in the new industrial towns. 
condition. What? And what leads you to that answer? Well, have you actually read it? Do you know that's what they're talking about? Yeah. Do I have to read it? No, you can just read it till, to be honest. You look at the image, you look at the caption of both images. Mm -hmm. What do they have in common? Slavery. They're, just, they're both discussing slavery, right? So, I mean, we don't even read all that. This is talking about slavery, this is talking about slavery, and the only one of those four options that's talking about slavery is what? Mm -hmm. See, so it seems like an easy one to me. We left one behind, didn't we? So let's go back to that one. So this would be our third pass question. We answered one, two, four, and five because they appeared to be somewhat easy to most of us. This was a bit of a challenge. So let's play process of elimination. Let's start crossing out stuff that we know to be wrong. Slaves in northern states were free. That's, that's wrong? Why do you think that's wrong? Because there weren't any slaves in the north. Because there weren't any slaves in the north. Bam. Now if I were to guess, my odds just went up to 33% chance. Is there another one I could pull out of there that I know to be wrong? African Americans were admitted to the Confederate Army. We know that didn't happen. Because the last thing that they were willing to do was to put a rifle in a slave's hand. <coughs> so now we are at the infamous 50-50. <clears throat> Any one of those we think right off the bat is wrong, or do we have to do some extra work? Okay, you're saying it's B. The war became a moral contest over slavery. You think that's the wrong answer? Oh, you think it's the right answer? C is the wrong one. Why do you think C would be the wrong one? Because they were immediately freed. Huh? They were immediately freed because there was like a moral contest about slavery. They were not immediately freed in the border states. If you know about the Civil War, that would actually have to wait towards... What, what was the amendment that freed the slaves? Fourteen. One less. Thirteen. Thirteen. But look what happened. Just by process of elimination, we got to the right one. That's how you do it, kids. That's the three-pass strategy. We just did a little practice for five questions. <clears throat> now you're going to go on Schoology. And everything that I just finished teaching you, you're going to put into practice. <clears throat> Small little quiz. Here we are. Oh, it's already up. All you got to do is click it. I have, to, I have to give you time. I have to set up the time. So, it's 12.15, right? Well, it's set up for 12.15. It's actually a long day here, so 21st. I'll give you about 15 minutes to do it. So, at 12.10, maybe 12.15, because we're not lacking for time today. <clears throat> ungraded, it's not for a grade, this is just a practice. There you go, guys. Go to your Schoology, yes sir. I'm gonna do it right now. I wanna set you guys up. Same story. Twelve fifteen. ungraded. So at 12.15, we will talk about the answer. <coughs> and that's a smart way to approach a multiple choice exam. 